everyone and welcome to our United in Prayer online gathering. It is wonderful to have you with us today as we continue to stand together united in prayer. It is a privilege to welcome Mariska van der Walt. Mariska lives in Pretoria in South Africa. She's married to an incredible man of God, Anrich, and they have just welcomed their firstborn son, Uriah, into the world. And Mariska is also part of our WOW family. She's responsible for all our online groups. And today, Mariska will emphasize that the primary focus of the gospel message is the transformative power of Christ's love and sacrifice, not our sins and failures. Mariska, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Carly. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Once again, I feel really privileged and honored to be here with you. So I was pondering this idea that we do not have a sin conscious gospel but a christ-centered gospel now paul makes this very interesting statement in first corinthians 2 where he says and i brethren when i came to you did not know did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of god for i determined not to know anything among you except jesus christ and him crucified the message paraphrased as follows, where it says, you'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's sheer genius, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches or the latest philosophies. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First Jesus, who he is, and then Jesus, what he did. Jesus crucified. Now, when Paul shared the gospel, the good news with the Corinthians, he preached Jesus, no more, no less. I don't know about you, but I kind of grew up in a church era where the good news being preached was this turn or burn message. You know, you were reminded of how flawless, you know, fault fails, your sins, how your failures and your dire need for a savior, you know, and if you don't, you'll go to hell. And I'm not saying that sin is not part of the story. That's not what I'm saying. But what I've wondered is why sin became the main character of the gospel when it's always been about Jesus. The gospel was never intended to be about our sin primarily. It's always been intended to be about Jesus, who he is, and what he has done. So even though forgiveness is a portion of it, forgiveness for sin, it's never the whole story and shouldn't be the entire story. It's but a chapter. You've heard people famously quote, you know, Romans 3, 23, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we stop there. That is our gospel. We've sinned and we need a savior. But I don't know if you notice, this is only a part of a sentence. We then go to read verse 24, being freely justified by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. But this too is not the complete sentence, but a part of it. Let us discover the full context of these two verses within the fuller picture where we read in Romans 3 from verse 21 that says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Can you hear the good news? Notice how many times the focus is placed on God and Christ rather than on our sins. 13 times Paul in these six verses mentions God and Jesus and what they did. And only twice does he refer to our sin. Interestingly, righteousness is even mentioned more often 
then our sin is mentioned in these four verses. Isn't that incredible? Maybe if Carly invites me back, then we'll unpack this concept of righteousness, which is a really rich concept and important for us to know as believers. But let's stick to the point. We do not have a sin conscious gospel. That in itself is not the good news. We have a Christ centered gospel. What does this mean? Well, today we're going to tackle the first portion of the conversation, and hopefully tomorrow we'll get to the second part. So if Christ is at the center of this good news message and sin is but a chapter in a lot of chapters, where do we start? What is this gospel thing that we have? Well, it doesn't start with our fall or our failures. It starts with the person of Jesus Christ. Here is where our gospel begins. John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Listen to Colossians 1, 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones, dominions, principalities or powers, all things are created by him. Can you see that he's the origin of all things? And listen to this, and for him, all things are created for him. He gives purpose and definition to all things. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that all things um, he might have the preeminence. If we do not begin with Jesus Christ, then we do not understand the whole purpose of creation. And so our gospel begins with the person of Jesus Christ. And now that we know there is a person, Jesus we start to ask, why is this person important? And this leads us to Acts 2, where we say, therefore let all of the household know of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Very interesting. So our gospel starts with Jesus. And now we realize Jesus was made Lord and Christ. And some translations would even translate Christ as Savior. So let's talk about the second part. Why Savior? Well, now we get into that conversation. Well, there was a fall in Genesis 3, and Adam and sin eat, you know, sinned in the garden. And due to their actions, we now understand Paul's statements in Romans 3.23. We've all sinned and fallen short. But there is a verse 24. We are freely justified by his grace through the redemption of Jesus. So Jesus being savior means our sins are forgiven, but not only are we forgiven, Paul uses very rich language, redeemed, justified, declared righteous by what Christ has done on the cross. What do these terms mean? Well, redemption is this notion of a ransom being paid to a slave so that they can be set free and no longer bound or found in bondage. They're no longer enslaved anymore. That's why Paul says in Romans 6 that we were slaves to sin, but now we are free. Justification, on the other hand, is not just forgiveness. It's so much more. It is when you are justified, it means that you are declared innocent of all wrongdoing. That's more than just forgiving you of something you've done wrong. You are said, no, 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 you are declared innocent. It's as if you have never done this before. This is why 2 Corinthians 5.21 can make sense to us when it says, For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So justification says you go to the cross with what you've done wrong, and you lay it at his feet, and you step away as Christ the spotless, blameless, declared innocent. Christ became sin so that you can be innocent and that you can become the righteousness of God. And so then we dive into this righteousness and I'm just going to skim over this because there's so much depth to this. But righteousness in its plain, simplest form conveys the idea of being in right standing with God. 
it speaks about this relationship that Christ has restored, the broken connection. He's restored that with God. Now we can enter into a restored love-based relationship with God. And we can boldly approach his throne as Hebrews 4, 16 declares, as his children, which we see in Galatians 4, 6. So can you see that forgiveness of sin is not just the complete picture? It isn't just the only end all and everything of the good news. For when Paul discusses what happened on the cross, not only with Christ, but with us being in included in that, you know, what happened there, he uses very rich language like righteousness, redemption, justification, which entails that this is so much more than just forgiveness of sin. This is good news. And however, this is not where the story ends. Believe it or not, this is merely one or two chapters of the full gospel. And if Christ, who he is and what he did, is at the center of this good news message, we need to understand that he's not just the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29, our Savior, but he's also Lord and Bridegroom. Now, that has huge implications for our gospel message. If we want to understand what that means, if we say he's not just Savior, he's also Lord. And this picture we get throughout the New Testament, even in Revelations, that he's the bridegroom coming for a bride. And so that has huge implications on this gospel message, which we have been entrusted with, the gospel, the message of reconciliation that we read of in Corinthians 2, 2 Corinthians 5. But this is all we have time for today. So I'm going to leave it here and let it simmer so that you can come back tomorrow to hear the second portion. So to be continued, let us pray. Father, today we are so grateful just for Jesus Christ. We stand in awe that you have given your son for us. Jesus, that you would freely lay down your life to save us and not just save us. You redeemed us. You set us free. You justified us. You declared us the righteousness of God. And by saying this, we're just scratching the surface of the depth of this good news you've given us, Lord. And so I pray that you will help us understand the breadth, the height, the depth of everything that happened on the cross and how we as believers are included in when you send your son, Jesus, to live, to die, to be raised to life, and to ascend to your right hand. May we understand that we are deeply loved and that you held nothing back, but you gave your very best by giving us Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mariska, thank you so much for this reminder that forgiveness of sin is only one part of our gospel. It's not the whole story. The essence of the good news is centered on Jesus Christ, who he is, what he accomplished through his death and resurrection, and the redemption and new life that he offers. The focus then shifts from guilt and condemnation to the transformative power of Christ's love and sacrifice. It was C.S. Lewis that once said the central Christian belief is that Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. And this highlights that the essence of the gospel is about grace and new life in Christ, rather than being trapped in the awareness of our sin. We will now be breaking into our smaller rooms to pray together. Our prayer prompt for today is, Lord, we stand united in prayer, grateful that we can have an intimate relationship with you, boldly approach your throne and live in your presence now and forever. For our Facebook listeners, thank you that you have joined us today. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow.